Hello everyone, welcome. Good to see you all here again today at this webinar organized by Chennai International Center. We are very happy that uh, Sanjeev Sanyalji, Principal Economic Advisor to Government of India is here with us today. Uh, before we hand over the stage to him, let me invite Mr. Gopal Srinivasan, Chairman of Chennai International Center to um, start the session, please. To welcome the speaker and start the session, please. Thank you. Thank you, Vanita. Um... And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Sri Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev, as we know him as, a, as friends, uh, he needs absolutely no introduction. I think the unique thing about him, in addition to his very, very vastly developed intellect, is his phenomenal multi-generational passion for India. His grand uncle is somebody all of us know, Sachindranath Sanyal. He gave up his job at a very, very eminent investment bank in Singapore, came back to India, uh, joined the government, and also wrote some stunning books which also went a long way to inspire people to rekindle their love for this country and for this culture. So this combination of economics and culture is amazing. And at a time when we are going through a calamity, which is unbelievably tragic, we need people like Sanjeev to help us think through solutions for what is seems to be an ongoing COVID world rather than a post-COVID world. So we will look, Sanjeev, to your thoughts on not only reform for a time when things are in turbulence, but a time when continuing turbulence can be there beyond our control. And yet we have to navigate to safety and make sure 130 crore Indians are happy and healthy. Over to you, Sanjeev, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Gopal. And um, it's a pleasure to be back amongst friends. I've spoken at CIC before on a variety of topics. And... Um, Obviously, I am doing this at a time uh, which is uh, one of particular uncertainty. So when we decided to do this uh, call, uh, this um, um, event, it was originally um, slated to have been done live. Uh, and I had put in all the plans to be in Chennai. But um, uh, in sort of in keeping with the theme of the talk um, uh, uh, of uncertainty, uh, I have ended up having to do this online, uh, which in some ways feeds into uh, what I'm going to talk about is how do you make policy in a world which is uh, very, very uncertain. And, it, and it's not just today. It has always been uncertain and always will remain uncertain. So how does someone um, like myself make policies for it? Or for that matter, uh, how do all of you uh, navigate such a world, whether you're a businessman trying to keep a business alive through a, uh, through through uh, very uncertain waters, um, or uh, even students who uh, may have had their um, you know, academic year and exams completely um, uh, thrown off uh, uh, the trajectory. So uh, this talk is about how do you deal with uncertainty and about the inevitability of this uncertainty. Um, and despite that, how can we make decisions. That's really what this is about. Now, originally when this talk was uh, thought about, we, I was going to talk about the post-COVID world. Uh, but uh, as you can see, we are still in an ongoing code world. But nonetheless, uh, the broader theme remains, which is that <clears throat> uh, the world is fundamentally uh, one that is not deterministic. Uh, it can go off in very um, unpredictable ways. And this is important to rem remember because um, the, whether it's the economy or the world at large, we are dealing with a system, uh, of, and I will talk about chaos theory and complexity a little later, we are dealing with a world that is fundamentally uh, unpredictable. It's not just that we're going through unpredictable times just now. It is fundamentally unpredictable. So uh, let me explain my point by t taking you back a few centuries. Uh, to relate a story I like to do. So those of you who have heard me talk about maritime history uh, may be familiar with the story. But I think it's important to tell you this uh, because then you will begin to see how our own times are not so, so different. So let's go back to the beginning of the 15th century. This is early 1400s. And this was a time in some ways um, not too different from ours. Um, it was a time of massive uh, technological change um, in multiple areas, but one area where there was a huge amount of technological change happening in the 15th century uh, 
was in the fields of cartography and maritime, i.e. shipbuilding technologies. So huge changes were going on and it was happening worldwide. It was happening in Asia and it was happening in Europe. So <clears throat> this was also a time, by the way, not too dissimilar to ours, when China was in some ways coming back after having been in decline for, uh, and in under occupation by the Mongols uh, in the previous couple of centuries. So the Ming dynasty had come to power. It had overthrown the, um, the, um, the Mongols and it had captured power. And uh, now it, what it was doing, uh, since it was by this, by this point, the sort of upcoming power in the world, um, it was technologically, economically, and in every other way, um, you know, a real behemoth, uh, far in advance of almost anyone around them. And so they decided that they were going to project power. And so the way they were going to project power in the, um, in the early 15th century was to send out these gigantic treasure fleets led by a uh, admiral, Admiral Zheng He. So between uh, around 1405 and uh, 1435, they sent out about 17 of these gigantic treasure fleets from China which made their way through Southeast Asia into the Indian Ocean. And they visited um, Africa, India, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia, and the entire area. And, if, and uh, they, they interacted with all the major empires of this region. Um, now, it is important here to remember a few things. First of all, these were not voyages of discovery. Um, because these routes that I'm just mentioning from China into the Indian Ocean had been sailed for um, over a thousand years by the Indians, the Arabs, the Chinese themselves. So this was really about projecting power and to some extent trade. And they really projected power. So Zheng He's um, uh, expeditions were non-trivial things. Uh, each one of them involved as many as uh, 25 to 27,000 uh, sailors and soldiers. Uh, and the ships they were using were far in advance of anything else uh, uh, the rest of the world happened, uh, had. Uh, even a century later, the ships being used by the Spanish and the Portuguese would be uh, not as advanced as the one the Chinese were uh, using in, uh, at this, in this period. And so these uh, <clears throat> thousands of uh, sailors uh, in their hundreds of ships made their way uh, through uh, into the Indian Ocean. And of course they traded, uh, they collected information, but they also maneuvered around the geopolitics of that time. So the Chinese attempted to change the king of Sri Lanka. Uh, they, had, they certainly um, interfered in the politics of uh, the Kerala coast. Uh, then <clears throat> they meddled with some of the politics of Arabia and uh, in Yemen area. And they uh, also uh, backed uh, the uh, kingdom of Malacca against the um, Majapahits, who are the dominant power in Southeast, Asia, in Southeast Asia, in fact, in the Indian Ocean region, were the Indonesians uh, who were led at that time by the Hindu Majapahit Empire. And so um, what they did, in fact, is quite interesting. They backed the kings of Malacca to essentially convert to Islam and then backed them then to push back against the Majapahit. So over subsequent several decades, the Majapahit would be forced to withdraw uh, and ultimately would withdraw into the island of Bali where the Hindu culture still, uh, still stays alive. But the Islamization of Southeast Asia, it should be remembered, was very much a, a Chinese geopolitical gambit here of that time. So this was a really big operation the Chinese were doing. So if I was circa, you know, um, 1440 or thereabouts, if you had asked anybody, uh, you know, there's going to be a country that's going to essentially dominate the world or over the next several centuries um, and a region of the world that's going to dominate the next several centuries. Almost everybody would have said it's going to be China and the Western Pacific that will dominate the world. But then things went in a very different direction. What happened is that the Ming emperor died and a new emperor came to the throne. And the new emperor who came to the throne was backed by the Chinese bureaucrats or the mandarins of 
uh, who were uh, from sort of a Confucian line of thought. And they looked on the uh, eunuchs, who were their rivals in the court, with great suspicion. So not surprisingly, they were very suspicious of the powerful navy and particularly of Admiral Zhang He, because obviously the navy was the source of power of the eunuchs. So now being good bureaucrats, they did what good bureaucrats do. The mandarins switched off the money uh, to the navy. And they also then suppressed all the records of the grand voyages. So not surprisingly, as you can imagine, the navy went into decline. And over the next several decades, Chinese power withdrew from the Indian Ocean. It didn't happen suddenly, but it did slowly but steadily withdraw from the Indian Ocean. Now, this left a vacuum into which Vasco de Gama and the, um, the, the Portuguese turned up. So in case you've always wondered, why is it that this rather small European country, which wasn't even important in Europe, by the way, as a, as a political power, uh, turns up with a handful of ships led by Vasco de Gama in the known Indian Ocean. And within a few years, it takes the whole place over. It wasn't just about the guns. I mean, you know, the, the, the uh, peoples of the Indian Ocean were not uh, were quite advanced economically and technologically. Uh, very quickly, they would have caught on to the use of the guns. Uh, they were certainly, uh, even the Chinese were themselves used to the existence of guns. In fact, they had invented gunpowder. So this wasn't quite the reason why the Portuguese were so successful. They were successful because by a twist of fate, um, the Chinese bureaucracy had forced uh, a withdrawal inward and they had left a vacuum which the Portuguese just turned up and captured. Now, there's no way one could have predicted this in the middle of the 1400s. It just turned out that way. Now, why am I telling you this long story? Because we live at a time when we have all these predictions about what the post-COVID world will look like. Uh, we all have ideas about how maybe some of us will say that China will take over the world. Some of us may be very nationalistic and say this is inevitable of the inevitability of the rise of India. Or we may say AI and certain kinds of technologies are the future, Bitcoin is the future, and so on. The most thing, important thing to remember about all of this is that history does not, uh, has not been kind to such predictions. So <clears throat> you go back, I'm not, you know, in my own lifetime, uh, when I was 18, I would not have imagined that within one year the Berlin Wall was going to fall. And that by the time I was uh, uh, in college, you know, finishing college, even the USSR would uh, cease to exist. Um, you know, the Brit those who created the British Empire and the German Empire uh, in 1914 would not have imagined that a single gunshot was going to cause the collapse first of the Germans and then ultimately of the British Empire itself after a, a yet another war. So history goes off in all kinds of different directions. And this happens also with technologies, with every other thing that you can imagine. Uh, for example, in the, in, in, in the turn of the, uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, if you had asked the biggest experts on what the major economic and urban problems of the world were, uh, you'll be surprised to hear the real problem that would have been identified at least with those dealing with urban life and cities was horse dung. And you can read up about, about it on, on the internet. The first large uh, sort of conference in the world on cities and urban economics was held in New York, I think in 1898, if I'm not mistaken. And almost all the time spent by it was on what to do about horse dung. Because at that time, the accumulation of horse dung in the cities, because it was a period of massive urbanization and ex urban expansion, uh, there was huge amounts of horse dung accumulating. In fact, there were forecasts by leading expert of that time who said that by the middle of the 20th century, London would have nine feet of horse dung and it would bury the city. And this was the key issue that had to be solved. And yet, within 15 years, horse dung ceased to be an issue because cars became commonplace. So if this is how uncertain the world is, then how does one make decisions for it? 
even a year, a, a little over a year ago, maybe in the beginning of 2020, nobody would have imagined that, you know, I, that uh, people in the higher echelons of the government would be spending time thinking about, uh, you know, oxygen supply and oximeters and things like that. Um, but that's precisely what is going on. So how does one make decisions in an environment? For this, I'm going to use an analogy, which also other, some of you may have heard because I've used it before. Um, which is about how a dog catches a frisbee. Now, some of you have got dogs. And if, even if you don't, you'll have noticed this in a park that the dog owner takes the dog to the park, then throws a frisbee, the dog runs along and catches the frisbee. Now, this seems to be a natural enough thing to do. But if you had a conventional, traditional economist, and I would include here many consultants and other experts. If you ask them how the, to make a dog catch a frisbee, the most likely way they would go about it is the following. They would say that you should go first to the park, then measure the speed of the wind, study the shape of the frisbee, the breed of the dog, the, the strength of the person throwing the frisbee, and then you should feed it all into a, a, a Excel sheet and run models around it. And this is basically what most economists do. So if you, you know, if you have the average economist trained in most of our uh, universities around the world, this is what they would do with, they would run a model around uh, on their Excel sheet the Excel sheet would then come up with a forecast of where exactly the Frisbee was going to land. They would probably take this information to a, the Frisbee policy committee and the Frisbee policy committee, which meets about once every two months would go through this data very solemnly and would then instruct the dog owner where exactly the Frisbee would land. And the dog owner would then take his dog, put a stick in the ground and tie the dog to that stick and would then go back and throw the Frisbee. Now, 99% of the time, the Frisbee would land somewhat different from what the forecast said. And the, and the dog would fail to catch the Frisbee. The only person who would, of course, be surprised by all of this would be the economist. And then they would spend the next several months writing a thick report in which they would explain why their forecast went wrong. Now, meanwhile, most people, most normal non-economists would be going to the park, throwing the Frisbee and their dogs would be peacefully managing to catch the Frisbee. So the question is, how do the non-economist dogs catch the Frisbee? Well, if you look carefully, you will see this is what broadly happens. The dog owner points the rough direction in which the dog <coughs> you're going to throw the frisbee. The dog goes and stands in front and then the frisbee is thrown. The dog runs along, looks at the frisbee. Then it runs along and follows and looks at the frisbee. It then follows the frisbee, looks at it and as it comes down, it locks in, jumps and grabs the frisbee. So what is the dog doing? What the dog, doing, dog is doing is feedback loop and adjust. It is watching the Frisbee, taking in the information and possibly entirely unconsciously adjusting to it. So this feedback loop and adjust is the way it ultimately catches the Frisbee. No amount of great modeling, uh, Excel sheet forecasting, capturing all kinds of data is going to help you do anything beyond reacting fast to actual events as they pan out. Now, this is an important insight. If you view the world through the lens of something called complexity theory, now how is this complexity theory different from the conventional way economists in particular, but others as well, many experts in other fields view the world. You see, much of economics is based on the fundamental idea that the economy is some sort of a gigantic Newtonian machine. 
and that it's running on some fixed rails like a steam engine um, which you may call it the trend line and supposing it goes a bit too fast you're supposed to pull the brake and if it's going too slowly you're supposed to shovel some uh, coal into the engine but by and large that is the sum total of what you're supposed to do and this comes from the problem that much of the this economics and for that matter management etc has at the back of the intellectual framework which is basically newtonian physics this is the reason why economics is full of these newtonian terms you'll hear about liquidity you will hear the terms like levers of fiscal or monetary policy um you will hear you know these hydraulics and mechanical terms that's because the underlying thinking is derived from this the problem is that the real world does not function like this the real world is a complex chaotic place it is made up of all kinds of different shocks and agents making decisions in all kinds of unpredictable ways and all of these are in inter linking and, and and interacting in unpredictable ways so if you are thinking of this world in this way then you are dealing with a world of unintended consequences of large shocks which have small impact and small shocks that have big impact people will be familiar with the butterfly effect uh, you are dealing with um complete indeterminacy in an environment of such complete indeterminacy <clears throat> you are essentially not in a position to do these nice neat forecasts so now i am coming to begin to the point where i am going to begin to explain many of the policies we took over the last year and how we are responding now and what we will do in the future based in all of this sort of line of thinking so i hope <clears throat> i you will have excused me for putting in place the intellectual framework first so let us now go back to year back to last march when just just before we put in the first lockdown what is the information we had and how did we respond to it well in the middle of march as someone who was involved in, in much of the decision making at that time let me say this is the information we had that something bad and nasty had happened in china it had spread to italy and had killed a lot of people we didn't know exactly what was going on in china but certainly from the italian experience we could see that it was whatever how was it it was was quite dangerous and that it was spreading to other places we didn't know anything else about the nature of this virus what its exact symptoms were how it spread and so on and so forth so like many other um, governments in the world we called in the experts and you will remember this because it's recent enough many of you will remember this we got a wide range of um uh, 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 possible outcomes some uh, epidemic epidemics experts told us that it was nothing much more than a bad flu and then there were others who said uh, oh my god it's going to kill hundreds of millions of people and you know this is you know this is literally going to you know this is much much worse than uh um, you know the spanish flu and so on again you will remember this from the debates of that time uh there was certainly one very widely uh, published uh, uh, forecast of that time which said by july of 2020 you know 300 million people would be infected in india alone and 3 million people would be killed by this so when you have this wide range of forecast what do you do and now mind you every government in the world would have had this problem so different governments in the world solved it in different ways so for example you had this this is so one way to deal with this is to look through the range of forecasts and decide which of these forecasts you think is the most sensible forecast and then respond to it <clears throat> and this is exactly what many governments did this is how you ended up with the swedish model or the uk government initially came up with saying that herd immunity is what they were going to do the 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 singaporeans opted for one model and changed their mind and so on and so forth now here in india we took a different view of it first of all we took the view that given the scale of our population and our limited resources whatever we decided we would have to stick with that strategy 
because it is not possible to change strategy in a country of our size. The second thing we understood is that rather than try and guess which of these various forecasts was the most sensible, let us start with the presumption that nobody knows, i.e. we are dealing with complete uncertainty. So once you have decided that you do not know, then you have to deal with this whole thing in a totally different way. And what we did, decided to do is something called a barbell strategy. This is not an uncommon strategy in financial markets. So let me explain what a barbell strategy is. The barbell strategy is that you use two opposing strategies in order to be able to uh, deal with a complete uncertainty. So on one hand, what you do, you hedge for the very worst outcome. And the other side, you do a step-by-step -step sequence of feedback loops to Bayesian update your information and deal with as you get better information to update yourself and move forward. Now notice here the similarity with the dog and the Frisbee. So this is a very similar idea here. I'm just pointing it out in case you're still wondering why I related the earlier story. Now this is why we did what we did last year. The first lockdown was not because uh, we knew exactly how things were going, going to pan out. Far from it, we didn't know. So what we did, we hedged for the very worst outcome. The possibility that it may actually be the worst possible situation and there will literally be hundreds of millions of people infected right up front and millions dying suddenly. So if that was suddenly going to happen, well, best you can do is just shut down the system. It also gave us time to put in place testing, put in place some protocols, put in place, buy some PPE kits in, in the scale needed um, to, you know, and so on, start the process of creating a vaccine and so on. So it gave us that time. And of course, there were other countries that also had a similar, that were going through this process so we could gather information. And as we gathered information, we felt more and more confident of opening things up. So you will remember the whole, the, the tightest lockdown was in April of last year. That was not the peak. By the time the peak was reached in September, we had actually opened a lot, lot of things quite a lot. Now people say that is counterintuitive. It's not. It's not counterintuitive because we were, as we realized the nature of the disease we were and had some capacities to deal with it, we were in a much better information capacity position to be able to open things up. So even though things peaked in September, we had opened things up very substantially by September. So this is why you have to understand that we are really responding to information, not to simply the, the uh, infection count. Now, <clears throat> by September, October, things began to again come off. And so this is the point, again, people ask, what was the economic response? How does this fit into this barbell strategy? Well, same thing. We were under tremendous pressure, as you can imagine, to do these headline grabbing, large responses as early as April uh, last year. And there were other countries which were doing these trillion dollar packages and they were saying, oh my God, um, you know, the economy slowed down. We must revive it as fast as possible. Let's create the biggest possible, um, um, you know, package. And other countries did it and maybe it works for them. But we resisted this call throughout. Why? Because from the right in the beginning, we took the call that this was not a sprint. It was a marathon. And in any case, there was no point in pressing the accelerator when we had our foot on the brake. Because we had, this was not a demand problem, it was a supply side shutdown problem. So if you shut down the economy, there's no point in pumping demand when there's no way for that demand to actualize itself. All it would do is mean that we would use up all our fiscal resources without getting any output for it. So this is precisely what we did. Instead, what we did is we, 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 we held our nerve and uh, did not initially pump up demand. Instead, as with the Bardell strategy, we tried to hedge for the worst, i.e. we provided a cushion to the most vulnerable sections of society. So we rolled out the world's largest food program. 800 million people were provided food in one way or the other, which is not a trivial effort. Same thing we did by pushing some money through Jandhan accounts into people's, the very poorest and most vulnerable sections, made sure they had some money. Now, 
At that time also, people said, you know, this tiny amount of money is not going to revive the economy. Well, we are not trying to revive the economy. We are just providing a cushion, a safety net. So we were providing a safety net. Same thing we did again with industry. The MSME sector was given 100% uh, guaranteed loans or at least extension of credit. Those who wanted could come to it. All the financial deadlines were pushed back so that nobody got caught in some financial deadline or some regulatory deadline which would cause problems. None of this was expected initially to ramp up the economy. All you were doing was providing a safety net. Only after October last year, when things had clearly peaked and were coming off, that is when we began to pump up government spending. If you look at the government accounts, you will see there's a very sharp spike, particularly in government um, capital expenditure starting from October and very substantial, double, triple in some months of what they had been a year earlier in those months. And that suddenly provided a boost that flowed through to the, uh, to, through the economy, flowed through um, to pent up demand that had also built up. And so you saw starting October, a sudden and very sharp V-shaped recovery in the economy. So much so that by February, we felt we were confident enough to be able to, in the budget, plan for an even bigger um, uh, sort of uh, effort uh, over, and, and promise that we were going to put in a huge effort into infrastructure building over a multi-year period and that we were not going to suddenly try and shrink the uh, fiscal deficit back too quickly because we understood that the economy needed some support over an extended period of time. So that was how we were dealing with it till essentially this second COVID wave came back. Now comes the issue, what do we do now? Now, first thing to remember is we always recognized that there was a possibility of a second wave. If you go back and look at my Twitter or Facebook and all these accounts, I even, you know, well into January and February, I kept saying, it's not over till it's over. If you remember, the prime minister kept stressing that, you know, just because a vaccine is coming down the pipeline, please do not take your eyes off, uh, you know, safety precautions. So this was important because we knew that this was always a risk. The problem was there was no way to model when this would happen. I know there'll be somebody out there who will say, oh, it's so-and-so model predicted it, but actually it's completely useless because there are dozens of models with dozens of forecasts. There is no way for us as policymakers to know ex ante which of them is going to work. And the, whole, and as I, the point that I made earlier in this talk was that in these complex systems, you cannot actually tell exactly when this is going to be. What you have to do is to keep your mind open to the possibility and then to act as fast as possible to the situation as it evolves. So it may not provide many people with what they would like is a, you know, if only we had a better plan. I'm sorry, the entire approach to these kinds of situations is only to be flexibly and quickly responding to evolving situations. That is the model. And it is almost certainly the only sensible model you can have under these circumstances. So you may uh, say that it is not fast enough or there are wrinkles in the response. That is fair enough. But to say that, you know, you did not plan for the second wave, which was almost certainly going to come is not quite fair because frankly, it is very difficult to have predicted exactly when it came. But it was a possibility that we had thought about. We didn't know when it would come or how steep it would be. It's certainly very much steeper than most people anticipated. But it was a possibility. And throughout the process, uh, efforts were being made consequently to first roll out the vaccines as soon as possible. Hence the urgency, you will remember, there's a lot of criticism at one point. Why are these vaccines being um, being rolled out, they haven't been tested fully. Uh, well, you know, no, no vaccine has been completely tested. They had to be given emergency OKs. And, it's, and ironically, many of those who are now saying that vaccination was not done fast enough were very often the same people who back in January and February were questioning why we were fast tracking all these vaccines, uh, particularly the case of Covaxin. 
na this thing so nevertheless we this was a possibility there are also many people who have now been critical of you know why was the kumbh mela or um, the election campaign uh, being allowed in the middle of such a major um, second wave and that this is the reason we have the second wave i'm afraid this is all uh, not quite true of what the data will tell you if you study it first of all um remember that the um, this the whole episode has only really happened from very end of february onwards that we begin to see in maharashtra in particular the spike in happening and since then to now the end of april uh, it's not been the election bound states or uttarakhand where the kumbh was held where the spike has happened uh, it has happened uh, with maharashtra being the epicenter of it it is still the worst hit state why it is the case i will let the scientists work out but certainly difficult to make the case that the election campaigns uh, caused this uh, particular episode to erupt uh, or for that matter the uh, kumbh mela um and even now it's the states like delhi uh, maharashtra and chatisgarh which seems to be the worst affected none of these three states are election bound and only kerala which is the next other state which is also uh, quite badly hit was election bound but had a very short sweet election which is well done and dusted some weeks ago so i think first of all the facts do not uh, support the idea that oh my god it's because of the election and the kum that this second wave has happened this is simply not true second should we, uh, these uh, these campaigns are they not a risk absolutely once we realize that the the second wave was clearly taking hold there is absolutely no doubt that having large gatherings with this knowledge that now new 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 information uh, acquired that we should do something about them and respond to them so yes therefore a response was done the kumbh mela and the last phase of the bengal elections have been very severely constrained uh, as you may have noticed some some people may argue should have done a little bit earlier maybe one can quibble with that but they were they were one not the source of the problem two they have now been very severely constrained given in light of the new information we have third point <clears throat> some people will say that since there was a possibility of this such a um, second wave happening why have these elections at all i've heard this argument as well now this is the problem you see when you're dealing with uncertainty you do not know when it will happen how it will happen or where it will happen now if supposing in anticipation the election campaigns um had been very severely constrained some people say that is the only sensible thing to have been done right from the beginning and let's say the second wave hadn't happened or it had happened let's say in july now i can assure you the same people who are now saying that you know why have these elections at all would have then be screaming oh my god this is fascism or that democracy in india is now being severely uh, impacted uh, and the uh, you know covid is just being used as an excuse to constrain demand uh, uh, democracy and free speech uh, i'm not just making this up uh, you have to remember just few weeks in fact in, in as recently as february and march there was a lot of effort uh, uh, put in by uh, particularly in the in the uh, foreign uh, think tank world uh, and uh, even in the indian certain sections of the indian press where clearly a narrative was being built up that um you know india is not a proper democracy uh, and since they cannot uh, quite uh, say that elections are not uh, held regularly and that they are not legitimate they came up with this utterly bizarre idea that india was some sort of a electoral autocracy now nobody knows what on earth that even means but this term electoral autocracy was created uh, to make this point now supposing 
uh, we had continued with uh, you know restraining the elections themselves then see then this would have been seen as look this is proof that this is electoral autocracy proper elections are also not happening it's not even electoral it's just autocracy so these are the kinds of things that go through policy makers minds and those who try to build up these kinds of narratives have to remember that you know they are effectively not helping their the cause by essentially creating these unnecessary uh, narratives which effectively have unintended consequences and and so so given those all those constraints the only sensible thing policy makers could have done was to watch very carefully for when this second wave took off and to respond as fast as possible now i know people say oh you know how is this fast um you're only you know only after the crisis took off were you get really going and arranging oxygen and all these kinds of things that is absolutely not true the fact is that in this last two days you have already have noticed massive amounts of oxygen being shipped around the country um huge uh, effort being put together for uh, all kinds of other requirements for example new beds are being uh, rolled out in, in in emergency by the army the itbp by uh, various uh, uh, non government agencies all of this doesn't cannot happen out of thin air they happened because already a certain amount of effort had been put in place as emergency measures of course despite putting them in place some time is still needed for roll out and that is why there was some uh, difficulty and may not have been, you know, one can always argue could have been more smooth but it is not the case that no arrangements had been made arrangements had been made and a response that you are now seeing which is which, which will is quite large across the country is being able to be rolled out precisely because certain kinds of um, systems had been put in place already and so now you will see that in the next few days i think much of the disruption that you are seeing right now uh, will hopefully um, get eased particularly on oxygen but even on beds and so on so i think be rest assured that we are on the ball um it is a model that is based as i pointed out on responding rather than predicting but the whole point i have tried to make is that that is the only way you can deal with these situations being capable of responding fast rather than blaming people for not having planned for it it is not quite possible to plan for things and very often if you do plan and execute for a certain outcome and it doesn't turn out you are likely to actually find out that you have ended up with other unintended consequences and criticisms Uh, that could you could face uh, if things do not pan out exactly how they they were supposed to so this is how things are now we will move into thinking about the post covid world no matter how complicated this particular episode is let me assure you we will climb out of it together um and um, you know the experience of the last one year suggests that um, indian capacity administrative capacity our business and industrial capacity and our social capacity is much stronger than people ever give us credit for so i am quite confident that we will climb out of this together in not too much distant future and you know perhaps there will be another third round who knows but i think the vaccine roll out that is happening is gathering pace um already 135 million people have been given their vaccines um and this will accelerate uh, you know a lot of support is now going into into providing a huge expansion in our cap- capability of providing vaccines um to ourselves and to the rest of the world by the way as well remember um, at least some of our manufacturers are contract manufacturers to the rest of the world we get the, 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 the we have we manufacture these things for ourselves of course but we we are able to do it basically because we also have to honor our export um obligations and that's something that we should still honor um now comes the last bit about the post covid world um 
how will the, the world be? As I pointed out to you, it is not obvious how this will evolve. Um, obviously, geopolitics will play an important role and we, you know, we, the emergence of the Quad is an important uh, development uh, in, 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 at, any, uh, uh, at any rate, it will have an important way, uh, a role in how we pan things up. Uh, economics is not just about uh, uh, finance and, uh, and uh, factories. Uh, it's also about geopolitics. In fact, much of economics is heavily dominated by geopolitics. Uh, and so geopolitics will play a role. So will the evolution of supply chains and new technologies. But all of these things will evolve in uh, very unpredictable ways by definition. Now, how do we consequently deal with it? Again, the barbell strategy. On one hand, you have to deal with trying to push for resilience on one hand, because you need to basically push in yourself against unintended and unknowns. And on the other hand, you need to be flexible. Why? Because flexibility will always triumph over your ability to plan. So that is the reason if you look at all the reforms we have done over the last one year, you will see that we have heavily emphasized supply side reforms. I have been frequently asked, why is India in the middle of a pandemic doing all these supply side reforms? Well, because we are investing into flexibility. If you see the reforms we do, they're all aimed at factor, factor market flexibility and deregulation. So whether it's the farm reforms, which have been debated for decades, and we knew there would be all kinds of pushback against it, but it was necessary and we did it. We introduced labor reforms, again, debated for decades, but has been now introduced. They are now, instead of the 44 central laws, there are four uh, codes. Uh, we did all kinds of other reforms as well. We removed all kinds of restrictions on the BPO and IT sector, which had been placed by the telecom sector and the telecom ministry. Uh, we liberalized completely the cartography and geospatial sector. And there are other sectors that we are happy to open up. The same thinking goes within, uh, in terms of trying to um, do privatization. We are unapologetic about privatization precisely because we think that the privatization and for most sectors uh, is key to providing flexibility to the system. Uh, notice here as well that uh, there are certain strategic sectors, maybe defense, certain kinds of banking, where the government in the public sector do need to retain certain presence and we will retain that presence. So this is not some ideologically driven idea. It is purely driven by the idea that you need to have flexibility and you need to be open-minded where this will go. And there is no way I can predict where it will go. So I need to make things as flexible and allow the creative juices, the animal spirits of the private sector to be able to take advantage of whatever emerges from there. We also have taken a few bets uh, through the PLI scheme, production linked incentive scheme, because we want to be able to create clusters in a few areas. Now, not all of them will work. They may not work the way we think that will work, but we understand that a few sectors need to be built up. So again, you can see what we're doing. We're creating a bouquet of options uh, for a uncertain world. We are trying to build up clusters in those. We are trying to create flexibility so the private sector can go and do different things which we never have, may not have imagined uh, take, and take advantage of the new dynamics and new supply chains that emerge in this new world. At the same time, we recognize that <clears throat> the system will be buffeted with all kinds of unintended uh, shocks. And this requires that we begin to take cognizance of the need for India to sort of leverage itself against these random shocks. And this is the resilience part that also needs to be taken. So the other, other side of the barbell. And in this context, you need to think about Atmanirbhar Bharat. <clears throat> Atmanirbhar Bharat, let me categorically state, is not a return to pre-1991 import substitution or license permit crunch. We have, none of us have any interest in going back to driving around in ambassador cars. So what is Atmanirbhar Bharat about? Atmanirbhar Bharat is simply about being, taking a practical idea 
of leveraging and protecting certain basic strengths that we already have by taking advantage of our large market, our, our large pool of young workers and entrepreneurs. And let me illustrate this idea uh, in different ways. For example, we did not participate in ARSA. This is not because we have some problem with doing trade deals. It is just that this specific trade deal did not work for us uh, because we already had uh, trade deals with everybody other than China. So effectively, this was a trade deal with China. And for a variety of reasons, we judged that this was not going to work, work for us. Now, this is not because we have some ideological problem with trade deals. It is quite possible that we will sign trade deals with other countries where it works for us. Let me give you another example. We discovered through last year that we may be a big pharmaceuticals manufacturer and it's a globally competitive industry. But this industry was heavily dependent on single source uh, foreign uh, sources for their uh, inputs. Uh, and if those inputs got disrupted for whatever reason, then this entire sector would just get stalled. Um, and so um, we have decided to provide certain amount of protection for key inputs into the sector. Now, is this protection provided to these key inputs a case of import substitution and uh, you know pre-1991 style protectionism? Or is it just a practical um, approach to maintaining the resilience of a key globally competitive industry. I would argue it is the latter. And we are right now, as we speak, getting a demonstration of it. Um, you know, we have the capacity not just to pr produce our own vaccines, but to supply the world. But a few key inputs um, are needed from the US. And the US, for its own reasons, has suddenly put restri export restrictions on those key inputs even though it has more than adequate for its own requirements and can easily supply it to us. In any case, we are the much more efficient user of those inputs. So from a global perspective, it anyway makes more sense to give it to us. But as you can tell, that's not necessarily how the logic uh, of global trade works. And so right now it has got stalled uh, or at least restricted. And so we are having to deal with it ourselves. Now, this impinges on our capability of producing vaccines. Nonetheless, we will you know, respond. We are putting in a lot of effort into creating our own supply chains domestically. But I'm just pointing out to you why you need to think both of flexibility as well as of resilience. And you do need to protect a certain amount of domestic indigenous capacity in key industries if you want to deal with this uncertain world which may not make sense if you think of the world in the old economics of optimization and uh, efficiency uh, in static efficiency. Static optimization will not, will not uh, lead you to these conclusions. But when you are thinking of it through the lens of complexity theory and chaos theory, you will see that many of our responses are not so crazy after all. We are basically dealing with an uncertain world, moving in unpredetermined paths, and with a lot of, uh, lot of random shocks along the way, where we have limited information about the future, sometimes no information about the future. And we are making our way through it um, uh, by essentially responding to those situations as they emerge. The, our game being to respond as fast as possible, rather than to be able to predict exactly how things would pan out. With that, let me stop and hand it back to Gopal. Sanjeev, uh, thank you very much. You've covered such a wide range of subjects and uh, uh, there are an enormous amount of audience questions and I would like to defer priority to those audience questions. So let me just start in an order in which uh, they have come. The first question from the audience is, what we have is actually a public health epidemic not an economic reform issue. Do you really believe the government has planned for the second wave and the third wave? And we see a lot, I'm grouping some questions here for you. One is saying, saying, look, you have been doing 
or contractual obligations is one thing, but vaccine Maitri to Brazil is entirely another thing. Did the government lose sight of the pandemic and become complacent and celebrate too soon and hand over power to bureaucrats who didn't have the political and social understanding to manage the issues and started spending time instead on Atma Nirbharta and elections? Should they not have focused more on basically preparing for the second wave rather than responding to it? So that would be my the first set of questions around just the public health response. Okay. So let me respond to this. See, as I said, a second wave was always a possibility. And, and if you go back and look at February and March, Prime Minister has been coming on television and repeatedly saying, it is not over yet. Please continue with this. But what we did do is we opened things up because remember that you know, the clock is always ticking on the economy as well and many other things as well. So you have to keep opening things up. Uh, you cannot say we're going to keep the system completely closed up because maybe there'll be a second wave. <clears throat> so since you do not have that luxury, you have to respond as it goes. So the same thing is being done here. By the way, we, have not run, we don't have any shortage of uh, vaccines in this country, even despite the various problems we have with importing inputs. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very important and clear that we should make this point. Uh, we are rolling it out in a systematic way. The reason for rolling it out in a systematic way is basically to maintain a certain amount of control over this process. Supposing we had just opened it up right up front uh, as some libertarian experiment, then let me tell you, just like you had large groups of migrants suddenly turning up in the uh, bus stops, you would have had large numbers suddenly turning up at clinics and hospitals and then complaining that they are not getting their vaccine. So a certain amount of order had to be imposed. And that order was, look, the frontline workers of various kinds get the priority. The very oldest people get the priority. Then you open it up to the plus 45. Then you open it up to the plus 18 plus. So this order had to be maintained. I think by and large, most people who went through this process would say that with exceptions, I would say the vast majority of people have, would have had a very smooth experience with getting themselves vaccinated um, so far. And so I think that order had to be maintained. Uh, if we had not maintained that order, in fact, the chaos of giving out the vaccines itself would have probably spread the uh, disease, uh, particularly amongst those who were the most vulnerable because they would have to you know, stand in long queues, old people standing in queues, trying to get vaccinated would not have been a pretty sight. So we maintain a certain order and we are going as per that uh, schedule. Um, on the 1st of May, we will open it up to 18 plus and so on and so forth. Two, you had to be very, very careful throughout this process that you are dealing with vaccines, which have obviously have to be tested fully. If you're going to hand out something to literally hundreds of millions of people, uh, then you have to be absolutely sure that, you know, the cure is not worse than the disease. After all, the same people are criticizing that, you know, we didn't do it fast enough, would have been the first people to tell us, oh, why didn't you test it before giving it to so many people? So the tests had to be kept done. And even after doing all of the delays for testing, we were still doing as recently, just day before yesterday, that stage three trial data for Covaxin came out. So even with the speeding up, we were still taking a chance. And this is not just about India, by the way. Everywhere in the world, all these vaccines are all, please remember, experimental and being released on, for, on grounds of but emergency. You. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm not a medical expert, but let me tell you, let's take the M mRNA uh, vaccines that are being widely used in the West. Right? Um, they, this is the first time mRNA vaccines have been used in such a large scale. They have been used in the past, but on li very limited usage with cancer and so on. When they were being rolled out right in the beginning, we had very limited idea about what would happen when you put it to a large number of people. In fact, even today, I would argue, we do not know 100% uh, on the very long term implications of mRNA vaccines because they have never been given to so many people. 
it's only in a decade we will know what its long term implications are now we made a judgment that it's worthwhile using it at least the countries that are using it have taken that judgment and good for them i mean may, and very likely they will probably that's the best thing to do but is isn't the case that there is no you know minute uh, probability that something completely unintended could happen as a result of this and you have multiplied it into your entire population so this is the reason we in india have had to be very very careful and so look at the vaccines we are using are much more traditional vaccines right even these we have tested very thoroughly but in fact if anything we have been conservative by using vaccine technologies that have been around for decades and decades and all of us have already been vaccinated using those so i would argue we have been much more careful and i think our guarded careful step by step approach and not getting thrown off by um you know sudden swings in data i think it will stand us in good stead it stood us in good stead in phase 1 where also we were people were going all over uh, uh, and panicking about various things advising on various things in the end we held our nerve and we did very well i think even in the second round we hold our nerve do all the uh, you know step by step things that we need to do and we sh- we will do well out of this i, I am quite confident thank you sanjeev in fact there are bunch of questions about you know state empowerment being removed in the second wave I, rather than go into that let me get into a second set of questions which are coming and these questions are around saying uh, isn't it fair to assume that given the magnitude of the problem that we're seeing on the ground heading towards more than half a million cases a day that lockdowns are really the only way to solve the problem at that level of scale hence what are we planning to do in areas such as forthcoming npas which were more likely to come are we looking at a migrant crisis uh, msmes have somehow managed barely to survive this crisis the government did a amazing job in sec first wave but what more do we need to do to protect the migrants the npas and the msmes should we start looking at an american style cash distribution program so uh, let me say that our thinking about this is the same as it was in the first round and that's why i explained the bavel strategy we continue with the exact same approach but it leads us to very different policies now because remember our entire approach is driven by how much information we have and how we understand this so in the first round we had no information so we did a lockdown because we didn't have either understand how this epidemic spread or what it did um or we didn't have any responses uh, in place uh, ppe kits testing vaccines nothing this is completely different so even though the numbers have uh, of uh, infected people may have spiked very sharply we actually have a very good idea about how to respond to somebody who gets it we have ppe kits we have testing facilities we even have a vaccine we understand for example if somebody gets it you need to measure their um, oxygen level something um, you know every other household or at least um, you know someone uh, in your family will now have an oximeter i had never heard of an oximeter before this episode for example so we are much much better position to respond so when you are in a position to respond we should concentrate on the response rather than doing nationwide lockdown which would actually dis- disrupt the response um you know if we had to go through a full lockdown like last time we would actually get in the way of moving oxygen around we would get in the way of uh, you know uh, all the other little bits and pieces that go into keeping the economy and industrial capacity going in terms of providing that response itself so when you can't respond you lock down and wait when you can respond you have to keep the system going as best as you can now of course lockdowns may be needed at a local level yes that has to be done in a decentralized way i cannot sit in delhi and decide whether or not uh, the area around cic uh, needs or doesn't need a lockdown so the local authorities have to be able to do it whether the municipal authorities or if necessary the state authority and that's why the prime minister made the point we will not go for a nationwide lockdown we are quite clear on this prime minister himself made the point now this is not big, therefore 
the the need of the lockdown the first time and the need of the lockdown the second time are completely different uh, scenarios and so in the second time the same people who advocated the lockdown the first the nationwide lockdown the first time are the same people who are saying it's a bad idea the second time you do need localized lockdowns but we have to keep the economy running as well as we can to keep the rest of the system the the flow of goods services etc that keeps the response going that has to be kept running and we will continue to do that thank you now so basically sorry continue yeah. sanjeev the impact of course there will be on msmes and other things and we will again go through the same thing okay. first of all uh, do the cushioning first impact has got to be cushioning and you have already seen yesterday another 2 3 months for next 2 3 months free food to another the same 800 million people so that you know people who have suddenly again gone back to losing their jobs or got stuck somewhere or whatever it is they 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 have at least got food if necessary we could even think of some money transfers at that level but right as with the first time and the second time we do not see this as the way to re reignite the economy we will continue to rely on when the time comes and 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 it, in some ways um we will get continue with what we said in the budget because we are not locking down so we can continue to do the capital expenditure of the infrastructure etc because there's more than adequate evidence to suggest that the uh, uh, the economic and demand response from capital expenditure is simply superior to giving out cash transfers in a generic basis i mean as i said targeted ones can be tried out we did that in the first round as well but the american uh, system of trying to stimulate the economy using cash transfers we continue to be suspicious of super i think as you, i think i get the message that you will be looking at various kinds of responses especially post the food maybe for the msmes and as you are awaiting yeah. watch program this is but a feedback loop based system so the feedback loop based system will continue good work fantastic and also lo localized lockdowns will create as you said a set of issues even though we will not have national lockdowns one question uh, which seems to be in a lot of people's minds is that um, you know india and america have become so close and yet there's a certain sense of being let down with the biden administration refusing vaccine for india a country which helped so many other countries by its example and also stopping raw materials for certain vaccines is that a shock to us that uh, the response hasn't come in the same way we reached out and they took two steps back so you have to always remember that uh, in the end every country will respond to its own interests we should assume that that is the case always our problem historically has been that you know we have had this this approach you know hindi chini bhai bhai non aligned movement all this kind of thinking uh, that has clouded ourselves we should always be clear that in the end um governments will respond to their most immediate requirements so we should assume with that and we should also uh, uh, you know create policies in line with it i explained to you why the atmanirbhar bharat policy is an india first policy and we should continue with that why are we somehow always uh, you know somehow apologetic about this we shouldn't be apologetic about it nobody else seems to be apologetic about it this does not mean that we will not uh, carry out our international obligations we have, we will go out of our way to do it if necessary um but we will also be to look at our own uh, requirements uh, we will uh, you know we will we will uh, if there are international uh, contracts and other uh, obligations we 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 will remain a good citizen of the world but we will also look after our own interests as well because everybody else does that so we should do it and i don't think we should be apologetic about it at all and as far as being surprised by america well over time relationships will build and maybe we will end up at a different relationship one day but it is still in progress clearly the um, I mean, there's a lot of appreciation for many of the policies the government has done and the, uh, from various uh, members of the audience both on youtube as well as uh, on uh, 
on, on, on the channel and lots of questions on classical economics and economic policy. But I just thought, uh, given the number of questions, I would uh, turn this to another question. And that is basically people have a lot of questions about your background as an urban uh, planner, in some sense, you've written a lot about urban planning and you're very passionate. You talked about the walking economy and thinking in one of your write ups. So one of the questions uh, people are asking is, should, is it time for the government to permanently think about incentivizing work from home, especially getting people to move to tier three, tier four cities, given the connectivity with that there is, a, should there be a po some kind of policy framework, which will actually encourage employers and employees to move to smaller towns. So <clears throat> while I am in favor of uh, walking and uh, so on, let me be absolutely clear. I'm in the end uh, driven by the idea of complex systems. And one of the points about complex systems is it is better to respond to how things actually evolve rather than to plan out a utopia. In fact, Complexity theory, people like myself basically said much of the uh, problems in the world uh, come out of people trying to plan a utopia. Whereas, in fact, it's much easier to see how the world really is and respond to it in whatever practical terms you can at that point. So I would argue I'm not going to create a policy framework to encourage people to work from home. It will happen naturally. But when and as it takes a certain form, and I have no way of predicting how it will be, but when and as it takes a certain form, we will respond to the requirements of that time to support that new lifestyle. So let us say, I have, as I said, I have no idea how exactly how it will happen, but let us say it turns out that people now decide they want to live in small towns because it's cheaper, the air quality is better, or whatever the reason they want to live in the small town, and they can now work from home. Fantastic. But we will now have to respond to that and change many things to allow that to happen. Maybe we need better telecom infrastructure or we now need to, in, to invest into certain kinds of urban amenities, urban buzz of various kinds in the smaller towns. You know, earlier on, it was all about big city lights and that's what attracted young people. Maybe it's about small city lights now and so on and so forth. But we will respond to how these things evolve as it evolves. The idea is to respond fast and do it uh, to the, what happens rather than try and have some preconceived idea of how it may be. So let me give you one example of how I think it could turn out. But this, by the way, this doesn't mean that we don't think about the various things that could happen. Um, you know, scenario, while it doesn't lead to prescriptive planning, it does need that we have to have scenario thinking and scenario planning to deal with different things. So it's a different kind of looking forward that uh, complexity theory people do. And I'll give you one example in the context of education, for example. It is quite clear to me that old style education of the kind that you spend four years stuck in, in some remote location, listening to a, you know, a bunch of lecturers and professors, that is already dead. And it's not dead just because of the lockdowns that we have had, but because now we have clearly demonstrated that education can function uh, with, you know, online. And if it can function online, why does it have to be with a professor um, uh, from your university? My own kids study abroad uh, and they are quickly discovering uh, that uh, if you want to study a subject, why do you have to listen to your professor's lecture on the subject? You can go into YouTube and find out which is the most popular person in the world who lectures on that subject and listen to that guy's lecture. So, you know, if there is some, uh, you may study a remote village college in uh, Cambodia, but you can listen to MIT professor's lecture on whatever that yes. subject is. So why on earth do you need to create this huge infrastructure? People have to go and live there for four years and listen to substandard lectures when you can listen to the best of the world sitting at home. Now, then it really means that you have to rethink higher education, at least, uh, if not uh, lower education, but certainly higher education has to be completely rethought. Universities, for example, I think will very quickly become places for doing research, 
and for doing certification and testing, but not for teaching. Now, at some level, it's a great thing, by the way, because it means that we, an emerging economy like ours, doesn't have to invest in ever more expensive, better universities. And middle class and upper middle class kids in India don't have to aspire to go to uh, US universities and pay $50,000 uh, a year. They can listen to all the lectures online anyway. All you really need is a believable testing system and maybe some new formats for doing, uh, you know, group learning. So I'm just giving an example where how this thing can completely rip apart and become new. Now, as I said, I don't know how this will happen, but as and when this new format comes up and it will happen within the next four years, four or five years, we should be able to reformat our entire higher education system to this new reality. That is what I would aim for, not trying to predict where it will go. Similarly, I have no intention of predicting how cities of the future will necessarily be, but as they evolve in a particular direction, I will invest into whatever that new paradigm is fast. Maybe this is a great segue Sanjeev into two couple of final questions. Um, one question is a very tactical question. Given that you and the government understand complex systems, have access to the best resources, talk a lot about <clears throat> excuse me, probabilities and modeling. What is the government's model of when the peak will take place? And when will the COVID infection rates come down to, let us say, sub 20 or 30,000 a day? Okay, so there are people in the government who do models and so on. But the guy you're talking to is not a great believer in the efficacy of any of these models. The modeling is only useful for knowing a range at best. It is certainly useless in terms of knowing exactly how things will pan out. So modeling, planning are useful for figuring out range, but they are not useful for predicting how things will pan out. So in fact, that was the purpose of this talk is that don't waste your time in believing exactly when it will peak. We don't really know, but what we can do is to respond quickly as things emerge. And that is basically what we are focusing on. We're not focusing on figuring out exactly where things will peak. We're focusing on providing the extra beds, providing the oxygen, continuing to roll out the vaccination process. And here again, new data keeps coming out. For example, it turns out that uh, the first jab uh, is pretty, provides most of the bang for the buck for the vaccination. So, and here take it with a pinch of salt since I'm not the guy making this decision. This is just a statistical observation from the economist guy, not the medical guy, uh, but just a statistical common sense observation from looking at the data would be, maybe we should roll out the first jab first and not bother with the second jab till much later. So focus on just the first jab and just roll, out, roll it out to as many people as possible because most of the bang for the buck is from that first jab. So yeah, I'm, just an, I'm just giving an example of feedback loop based decision making. But as I said, take it with many pinches of salt since I'm not the epidemics expert in the system. And the, and the last tactical question before we go to long-term questions is that, do you think we can hit 10 million jabs a day within the next two weeks? Again, I'm not the medical guy in the system, but I think we could certainly ramp it up from where it is now uh, significantly. Uh, we have the vaccines and we are ramping that capacity up very, very rapidly. And if the last set of questions are many people really appreciative of your thoughts on probabilities, Bayesian modeling, complex systems, artificial intelligence. And the question being asked is, how would policy making a year or two from now have learned from this series of calamities that has forced us to be iterative in our response mechanisms, use theories of complex systems, collaborate more with states? You, have, you yourself alluded to local response being superior in certain events. And perhaps it could also been equally superior where vaccines also done the same way. So the question, what, you, your, what is your vision of future policy making in terms of learning from 
this this calamity what have we learned what will we do differently if we had to prescribe saying here are three four things what would that prescription look so like i i do i do think that what we need once this is over to properly do a case study of it and under, understand various things with how what worked and what didn't and to incorporate that into our training of our civil servants and into the thinking mm-hmm. and uh, material that is taught in our universities in uh, you know economics and management line of uh, study because one of the major pro- reasons why we default to, to this rather soviet harvard problem of uh, you know uh, trying to solve problems through ever better predicting is a common fallacy and let me spend a few minutes explaining why the complexity system is a way of and co- is fundamentally different from what is conventionally taught you see most of economics that is taught is taught either from with a socialist bent or a neoclassical bent markets bent but in fact people don't realize that there are actually two variants of exactly the same idea the idea is that there is some optimal equilibrium to be that can be discovered and that is what we should all aspire to mm. only difference between the two schools is that the socialists think that wise men usually they are men sitting in the planning commission know how to find this optimal equilibrium and the neoclassical people think that if you know the markets are left alone they it will naturally through the invisible hand find mm. that equilibrium but both of them are based on this idea that there is such a thing as an equilibrium but it is actually a religious belief there is no evidence for this equilibrium ever existing so complexity theory people actually mock the idea of the equilibrium itself and are saying there is no equilibrium when was the world in equilibrium you know every 10 years if you go back you will find some crisis or the other right now we are going through this particular pandemic 10 years back we had the great financial crisis which at that point everybody said the worst thing ever happened but if you went back 10 years before that to around about 99 2000 you had gone through dot com bubble asian crisis this that the other if you went back 10 years we have before that you will have this collapse of the soviet union the gulf war so every all the time we are in disequilibrium so it's a complete waste of time looking for this equilibrium and therefore to create systems that are flexible and able to deal with uncertainty and so you need to create institutional structures that can deal with it that's why by the way i'm a big advocate of legal reform because if you don't know how things will pan out and things go wrong you need a legal system to ex post sort out things and enforce contracts that's why i am a big advocate of insolvency and bankruptcy courts because no matter how well you do it things will go wrong you need to liquefy whatever got assets that got stuck as a result of you know things going wrong even with all the best decisions uh, i am therefore in favor of doing all these reforms you heard about keeping factor markets flexible on the other hand i am extremely suspicious of anything called the planning commission so i am very grateful it was shut down but i am equally suspicious of people who somehow think that naturally the market will go somewhere it doesn't so i hope i have given you a flavor of my thinking process and the link to how the kinds of things we are doing i have a one last question uh, just to add to your idea about what will we do differently in the future in fact a lot of people have asked this question saying uh, sanjeev sir what is your opinion about judicial reform and can you go into specifics on what they will do but i think we're short short on time but a most interesting question do you think our education system especially during the school high school period tells students more about the power of the private sector and the capitalistic economy um is that something that people are born with are taught or are they taught more something going back into the past about the power of socialism do our education i think there is school- a structural problem in all our teaching in that you know 30 years after 1991 if you read our textbooks we will still be learning about the wonders of uh, the mahalanobis model when it clearly was a failure and anybody who lived through the 70s and 80s will uh, testify to this so i don't know why we continue with this 
um, sort of bent. That's of course partly a global problem because media, the 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 academia has historically, at least in recent decades, been captured by a certain line of thinking, which doesn't allow for this. But let me also say that I, as I as I pointed out, the reason I think capitalism works is a completely different reason than what neoclassical economics says it works. So you need to understand this difference. I do not believe in the neoclassical optimal equilibrium at all any more than I do in the socialist utopia. So why does capitalism work is for a completely different reason. It works simply because it is flexible. It is not that capitalists understand the world any better than the non-capitalists. It's just that in a market economy, if you take the wrong decision, you get wiped out. So creative destruction happens faster. On the other hand, in a state-run system, the bureaucracy will find reasons to perpetuate precedence and will not make the corrections fast enough. So that is the only reason. It's not that the capitalists are brighter than the bureaucrats. They are not. It's just that the skin in the game of the capitalist is higher than that of the bureaucrat. That's all. So consequently, the bureaucrat does not have to respond flexibly. The capitalist, if he doesn't respond flexibly, gets wiped out and replaced by somebody else. So consequently, the flexibility of the capitalist system, rather than its ability to find the optimal equilibrium through the working of the invisible hand, that in my view is the real driving force of, uh, of its success. And consequently, creating institutions that allow this creative destruction to happen for me is much more important than have some preconceived notion in the brilliance of markets. So that is why I'm far more interested in the insolvency and bankruptcy code, as I pointed out. I'm far more interested in uh, risk taking by new companies. I'm far more interested in, for example, enforcement of contracts. Because I fundamentally believe in things going wrong all the time. So things that are res resilient to things going wrong all the time and benefit from that process uh, through that evolutionary process. After all, me and you are the result of large numbers of mistakes made through the evolutionary process. So we can create successful species um, and you know, complex civilizations through this iterative process. Uh, I don't know what the problem is about running um, the economy using this well-established process. Uh, instead of trying to have this idea that there is some great golden egg that we have to all aspire to. Sanjeev, absolutely. I think it's been, I think, uh, this very complex situation with so much of chaos. I think you steered the conversation and your thoughts towards how to manage this complex situation. The words I took away from this is complex systems, continuous instability, continuous adaptation. And basically using individual entrepreneurship, individual initiative through the system of capitalism and market forces of creative destruction. So I took away all the five C's from you, the complex systems, the continuous adaptation, the continuous instability, the use of capitalism as a way to basically make sure that through creative destruction, things will stay in control. We all will remain uh, hopeful. We will also remain prayerful. All of us need to do everything we can to help everybody around us. And first, for us to itself, to keep our families safe and keep everybody safe. And I'm sure with the government now fully in gear back again in managing this crisis, we will see the light much sooner at the end of the tunnel than later. So thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we've had a phenomenal number of questions. There are 51 questions on the channel. There are 20 more questions on YouTube. So we could actually go on for an hour very comfortably. But I think you've covered all the points as always. So not only uh, insightfully, but also in your very attractive way of speaking. So we also understand the complex things in a simple way. So thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you very much for being with us. Vanita. Manita, you're on mute. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sanjeev Ji, for joining. Um, uh, let me just take a quick minute to, uh, you know, request everyone to send in your questions about COVID-19 second wave to us. We are doing an AMA podcast with Dr. Jay Prakash Mulel, India's top virologist. 
So um, we would really like you to request, uh, we would really like you to send in your questions to admin at CIC.in. Thank you uh, for joining and good night. Good night. Namaskar. Thanks. Good night.